every child is supposed to love Santa. In fact, it seems every child is contractually obligated to love Santa. But here's the thing. While every child claims to be fond of the fat man, in reality, not many actually are. They love the idea of him, of course, the twinkle of tinsel and the promise of presents, as well as the fact that the dude can tap his nose and get phenomenal gas mileage solely on the horsepower of eight tiny reindeer. But all that naughty and nice stuff. He sees me when I'm sleeping. He knows when I'm awake. Shouldn't someone be prosecuted for that kind of behavior? I honestly wasn't a fan of the guy, and I didn't know any kids who readily queued up to sit on his lap without some sort of bribery or enforcement by their parents. Something was off about the guy. I didn't trust him. So in 1977, when my grandmother brought my cousin Tommy and me to the Abraham and Strauss department store in downtown Brooklyn to visit none other than the fat man himself, Santa, I plainly, abjectly panicked. My cousin Tommy was five. He hadn't reached the age of reason yet, so he happily prattled on in the back seat of the car about Dr. Zaius and Cornelius and all the other Planet of the Apes action figures he was going to ask Santa for. I, however, felt my seven-year-old pulse throbbing at the side of my neck because I was in Catholic school and preparing to make my first communion the following spring because I was learning about original sin and penance and the intolerable shame of humanness and because all of my terrible misdeeds were about to be found out. Look, I could certainly ask Santa for an easy bake oven and a Barbie dream house, just like the next kid, but why go through the tiresome exercise? The fat guy already knew that I'd erred far more on the side of naughty than nice. He apparently knew each and every one of my petty crimes, that I regularly stuck my tongue out behind my mother's back, that I swiped a Mary Jane from the penny candy bin at the corner store, that I whispered swear words like string of prayers, shit, fuck, damn, shit, fuck, damn, under the covers at night. Sandy had some sort of godlike omniscience thing going on, as well as the infamous naughty and nice list, which he had obviously annotated for easy reference. He knew everything, that red velveteen weirdo, and I didn't stand a chance. Besides, it was the 70s, and I was from Queens, we didn't have fireplaces in our houses. We had bars on our windows and switchblades hidden in our earth shoes. If Santa could get into my house in the middle of the night to deliver presents without the use of a chimney, then clearly he was a burglar who had done hard time and he was someone to be feared. Eventually we arrived at the department store and rode the elevator to the top floor. My cousin stood beside me blissfully sucking on a candy cane and adding to his list, which now included Hot Wheels, a light bright and the piece de resistance, the highly coveted green machine, the low slung mag wheel stick shift ride of choice amongst the primary grade set. What a putz, I thought. Jesus himself wouldn't ask Santa for the green machine. A rookie mistake. We arrived at Santa's village, conveniently located on the sixth floor near the ladies' lounge, to find a long, snaking line of people waiting to see good old Sandy. Perfect. This bought me some time to form an escape plan. I could fake a stomach ache, but my grandmother wouldn't buy it. I could hop on one leg and claim a need for the restroom, but then we just have to get back online and wait all over again. Then it hit me. My cousin was my ticket out of this mess. A few weeks earlier, Tommy and I had watched Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom after our family's Sunday dinner. We sat cross-legged together in front of the TV and watched as flying squirrels moved in slow motion across the screen. I was enraptured but my cousin was terrified. He screamed at the sight of them with their flappy skin and their taut tails and insisted that we shut off the TV. His fear, I realized, was my ace in the hole because in Santa's village, there were toy airplanes zooming on invisible wires around the perimeter of Santa's garland bedecked chair, but from a distance, they could be anything really. Flying squirrels even. This was my one shot and I had to take it. I surreptitiously leaned down and whispered in his ear, look, Tommy, I said, look over there. My cousin slurped anxiously on his candy cane, his eyes searching the department store horizon. See what Santa has? Santa has flying squirrels up there. I 
think he keeps them as pets. Mission accomplished. Tommy shrieked until my grandmother had no choice but to leave the line. It had taken us a full hour to find parking on busy Brooklyn streets, and she was none too happy about having to leave without checking a Santa visit off her list. She asked Tommy why he was so distraught, but he just kept screaming until Santa's village was no longer in view from the sight line of the descending escalator. Then she turned her attention to me. Playing the innocent, I shrugged my shoulders. Maybe he shouldn't have eaten that candy cane, I said. My mom says he gets hyperactive when he eats too much sugar. Her eyes told me that she knew I'd been guilty of something in this Christmas passion play. She couldn't discern what, but her instinct was correct. She offered me the silent treatment for five more escalator flights until we arrived at Abraham and Strauss's grand main floor. As Brooklynites scurried by with their shopping bags, a burning ball of shame grew in my center, telling me that the sin of cruelly tricking my little cousin was far worse than facing my fear. I was unequivocally guilty. I had once again been acutely, horribly naughty. There'd be nothing under the tree for me this year. Clearly, I had taken things too far. But a few weeks later, on a snowy Christmas morning, my stocking was miraculously full, and there were stacks of presents under the tree for me with my name written in perfect cursive on the gift tags. Santa had even spelled my name correctly, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N, not Kathleen with a C or Catherine, as everyone else, including my teachers, so often had. Santa knew me. He really, really knew me, flaws and all. And he still put me on the nice list. Maybe Sandy wasn't such a bad guy after all. And maybe I wasn't such a bad girl either. Maybe there was hope for me yet, and for all of us. Thanks. Oh, thanks very much, Kathleen. What a lovely story. Um, I like the fact that your grandmother just instinctively knew that you were guilty. She didn't know what of, but she just knew you were guilty. <laughs> and so there was kind of preemptive punishment of the silent treatment. Yes. I don't know how grandmothers have that instinct, but mine certainly did also. <laughs> they always, <laughs> especially Brooklyn ones. Brooklyn ones definitely. <laughs> Well, yeah, I haven't met many Brooklyn ones, but I'll believe you. <laughs> is there is there a storm coming close to where you are? There sure is. We are supposed to get uh, 12 to 20 inches here in the New York City area. Wow. So um, on top of everything else, the biggest snowstorm in the last five years. But I'm going to try to enjoy it. If the power doesn't go out, I'm just going to try to enjoy yeah, it. I know. My God. 